we like to call it the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. Hey, welcome to the Supernatural Hour podcast. I am your host, Raven. I'm Chad. This is Emmett. And this is Doc. All right. So, is somebody going to talk about who the main topics brought to us by? Oteos. Oteos. Fine Mexican dining. Very. I've been there a couple times recently. It's excellent. Where are they? In Linden. Oh, okay. Right on State Street. When you're feeling up to it and you feel like traveling down to Utah County, you need to come down. We'll take you to go eat there. Sounds good. Doc, have you eaten there? I have not been to Oteo. Okay, you got to take... But I, I know where it's at. I've just been. You got to take Lindsay. Maybe we'll have a little team meeting. Ooh. Yes, yes there you should. Go. Okay. I'd be okay with it. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. Okay. So our main topic today is Mary Mallon. A lot of people go, who is Mary Mallon? Well, the funny thing is I knew who she was. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I wrote it down in our list of podcast topics and then didn't do her like for a couple of years. And then I put the name down. It's like, oh, this is on the list. We need to talk about a person this time. So when I went to go Google her, I thought, I don't remember who this person is. And as soon as I Googled her, I was like, oh, oh, yeah. I know who this is. She was an excellent cook. She was a very good cook. That's right. That's what she's known for was her peach vanilla ice cream. Yes. (laughs) So end of podcast. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people will know her as Typhoid Mary. Yeah. Yep. That's when I looked her up, that's what it was. It's like that okay. Because I had no idea of Mary Mallon. Yeah, and there's there is a paranormal bend to this. So so bear with us. Bear with us. We'll get there. That that will be the grand finale. But Mary Well her her desserts were to die for is what I'm <laughs> You know, so she was born in Ireland in what they say, 18, 1883? Yeah, 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. I did not take notes, folks. This is all coming from my, my amazing memory. So maybe you should be afraid. <laughs> but anyway, she was born in the late 1800s in Ireland. And if I remember right, she came over to the States by herself. When she was 14. When she was 14 years old. She did stay with some relatives mm-hmm. yeah. when she got here. So it's just, it was, you know, after the potato famine. So things are, are difficult in Ireland at the time. So over she came and, you know, she became a, a, a good cook. And she, and I'm sure she knew she could cook in, in Ireland, but she worked in all the rich houses yeah. back east. So when you think of the prejudice that was being waged against the Irish at the time, I mean, there were, you know, anti-Irish societies. There were whole things about not wanting the Irish here. You know, there was a lot of discrimination and prejudice against the Irish. No and, Irish need apply. Yeah, lots of that kind of stuff. And the fact that she was being hired by the elite of New York society, she had to be a good cook. She had to be someone that was, was quite phenomenal at, at cooking and you know, her domestic skills that way, because as the story goes and we'll lay it out, she was recommended over and over and over to different, very wealthy families. Right. And I don't know why one, well, no, I do know why actually. Um, We'll get there. But yeah, she didn't work just for one family. She worked for many. Yeah. Like nine or 10 different families. Mm -hmm. The story kind of comes to a head when she's working for a family in Oyster Bay. And Oyster Bay at the time would have been like Martha's Vineyard now. It's where all the rich and famous people live. I think it was on Long Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was working for a banker there. Was his name Warren? Mm-hmm. And he did all the banking for like the Vanderbilts and Yeah, the all very those. rich. Yeah, he was like a big time banker. Well, a whole bunch of people in his family came down with typhoid. I think one of them died. And so he called in basically... A health inspector. A health inspector. They called him something else. A civ- the, they, I think on one of the things they called him a civil engineer. I'm like, I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> um, but basically a health inspector um, slash detective. 
rat catcher. Mm -hmm, To kind of figure out what's going on. And so he came in, and he's testing the clams, and he's testing... You know, the water. Yeah, he's checking all the plumbing to make sure that everything's good, that there aren't any contaminated water sources. Mm -hmm. And we do need to back up. At the time, typhoid was a poor people slum disease. Rich people did not have typhoid. Typhoid. It it was not a rich people thing. And we can Typhoid is, I was going to say, typhoid is spread through fecal oral contamination. So in sewage or from people improperly washing their hands or people. Just having it, you know, contaminated by touching the doorknobs or having it in food. Right. You know, we look at today like salmonella, you know, everyone knows what salmonella poisoning is. You've always hear reports of salmonella outbreaks. Typhoid is salmonella typhi. It's just a variant of that same bacterium. Right. And I back was, then they did. I was biotics. just going to ask you that question if it wasn't just a, a type of salmonella. And interestingly, is, Mary is on record as st- stating that she seldom washed her hands. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway, it got down to uh, they figured out that it was her. And the re- one of the reasons that she went to so many different families is the family would have an outbreak and she would leave. And I think somewhere deep down inside, she didn't know why but she knew that something about her was making people sick. And so as soon as people got sick, she'd leave and, and go work for someone else. And as they were doing, as this, um, I can't remember, Soper, was his name Soper? I think it was, yeah, Soper. Uh, the, de- the detective, the, the typhoid detective. He. I um, even saw that it said doctor in some of it. Was it a doctor I think Soper? it may have been a doctor. And I don't know if that's a medical doctor or a... You Just know, a doctorate. A doctorate, but yeah, it was a doctor so far. Yeah, so he, he was able to kind of put together that she had been the cook for all these families with all these outbreaks. So Dr. Soper gets to go and knock on her door and basically say, and I'm sure he said it a little more genteely than this, but, you know, in, in the early 1900s, he has to say, Mary, I need a sample of your poop and your pee. <laughs> so it didn't go over too well and she chased him out of the house but he was able to uh, you know prove his case to the police the health and department so, and the health department and so they had some people from the health department and the police department go over to her house and force her to give them the samples that they needed um, tested them she tested positive so they quarantined her on this little island was it called Brown's Island I don't think it was Brown's Island, but it, yeah, there's a... Something like that. There was one other little interesting thing about that, because there was a time that she did test negative for it. Yes. She tested negative, and, you know, but then she tested positive, so they quarantined her on this little island. You know, they had other typhoid patients there and some other patients with some other quarantinable maladies. It was called North Brother Island. North Brother Island. I was, I was close. Brown Brother, it's, it's close. They gave her her own little house. It's kind of cute. I mean, it would suck right. to be quarantined, but it was a cute and little And that's house. actually the place that they that is speculated she still haunts, correct? Yes. Ah. Uh-huh. Yes. So See, the, I knew we'd turn this paranormal sooner or later. <laughs> Here I am wanting to talk about medical stuff. I'm like, no, she was an asymptomatic carrier. So. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> you know, where we get to go into it. Exactly. So. That's- so, Doc, this is where you can kind of talk about what an asymptomatic carrier is. Well, she just has salmonella typhi basically in her digestive tract, even though she's not experiencing the symptoms, right? She doesn't have the copious amounts of diarrhea and illness and dehydration. She didn't look dehydrated, emaciated, whatever. And so she just continued on doing her thing. Um, but because she carried this, uh, bacterium, she's spreading it to everybody else who became very, very ill from it. Right, and you have to think of the times, too. Really quick before I do that, she was basically one of the first known asymptomatic carriers. Asymptomatic carrier, but uh, she was a super spreader. That's the word we would use now. Well, and, and like the, the germ theory hadn't even been accepted that long in, in modern medicine. Right. You know, so. so you think about this Irish woman you know, in the late from the late 1800s, early 1900s, she's not quite understanding what a asymptomatic carrier is. 
Um, she just knows that, you know, she's just cooking food. She's not trying to make people sick. I'm not sick. You know, she's saying, I'm not sick. I feel fine. Right. And you're, she's probably feeling a lot of persecution for being Irish. Yes. You know, you throw that in there too. Is this just because I'm Irish and people mm-hmm. are... They're making up crap about I'm me. being a scapegoat. Exactly. But they did say that she was just not very hygienic. And, and it's the early 1900s, but the whole idea of washing your hands really was relatively new at that time. I mean, it's not like it had been hundreds of years of washing your hands. They so, didn't have Perel on, on every sink. Right. And, you know, they asked her, you know, did you ever have typhoid and recover from it? She said, no, I, you know, to my knowledge, I've never been sick. So whether she was sick and just didn't have, Mildly or you know, the symptoms, a mild case, or maybe just she just thought she had a little cold and then got better, or whether it was just naturally in her system is kind of unknown. They did say that after she died, they took out her gallbladder and it was full of the bacteria. But some people say that that's... Even questionable. Even questionable. So we don't know. So she is quarantined on this island. They kept her there for three years. And they tested every bodily fluid that she had. They tested the... the Tears? The, her tears. They, te- they tested everything. Her sweat, her... Yeah. Urine. We won't even get into all the stuff that they tested, but they tested any any place that fluid could come out of. They tested it, and they said it just. They said every once in a while they would get a negative test, but they said you know the majority of them always tested positive. So they talked to her after three years, and they said, "Okay, we'll let you go, but you cannot cook anymore. You're done cooking." You can't cook for people. You're making people sick. You can't do it. She's like, okay. Yeah, because most other things where she wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't be ingesting that virus. She was fine in in most social situations with people. Yeah. So um, she started working as a laundress. And they lost contact with her pretty quickly. She kind of went underground. You didn't report in? Mm Mm-hmm. And the problem with being a laundress at the time is they just didn't pay as much as these high society cooks. And so it wasn't too long that she went back to cooking for these high, you know, for these rich families. And she actually got into a, she would use a a pseudonym. Mary Brown? Mary Brown. There was another one too. But she, she would use her real first name, but she'd change her last name. Well, um, she did this for a while and they hadn't, she was working at a hospital as a cook at this hospital and the hospital had a break of typhoid and so they call in Dr. Soper and doctors you know and they're like we don't understand why we have typhoid we're a hospital we understand that you have to wash your hands and you know and we don't understand how you know we we clean up stuff and we're hygienic we don't understand how we have this this typhoid and so he's you know researching and digging around and asking who works there and um Sure enough, he goes into the kitchen, and guess who's there? (laughs) Mary? Mary Brown. Mary Brown, but she looks an awful lot like Mary Mallon. You know, one of the things they said was, you know, most of the time the food is cooked, and that would kill the typhoid, right? That would would kill the bacteria. But her specialty was peach ice cream, which you don't cook, right? So people were getting it from the ice cream. You know, most, I mean, other things too, I'm sure, but that was one of the the big spreaders. Uh, they took her back in. Back the, to the island. Back to the island. The first time she went under, you know, just duress, and they said that just to get the samples and get her there, I mean, she was kicking and screaming, and you kind of get it. You know, she's feeling picked on, but this time she went back, um, you know, willingly, and they kept her there until she died this time. They did say that after a while they would let her go on excursions, um, but she could go into the city and do things mm-hmm. where she wouldn't be cooking and being a threat because mm-hmm. just her being asymptomatic didn't mean that she was a threat to people in general. In general, but yeah, it's when you know you are contaminating things with the like the, the food. typhoid mm-hmm. um, food and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, she- how infuriating would it be when she's already spent three years in quarantine? She's aware that she's a super spreader. She's been told not to work. And then of all places, you find her in a hospital cafeteria. So I would be, I would be super angry about oh, that. Oh, absolutely. But one of the things they said is when they released her after the first three years, they said one of the things is that they really didn't prepare her 
to go out. They didn't, they said that the explanation they gave to her, you know, just wasn't thorough enough, thorough, you know, of, of why she was dangerous. And they also said that they did not teach her any skills or give her any, you know, hey, you can't cook, let's teach you some skills so you can provide for yourself. They're just like, don't cook anymore, bye. She had three years. They had three years to have the talk, three years to learn some skills. Right? Yeah, definitely a fail on that part. Yeah, so they, they said that, you know, just the people that had quarantined her failed her a little bit too because they, they didn't prepare her in any way, really. Yeah, and there were there were several deaths. You know, when you think about this, it wasn't like hundreds or thousands, but they said that they're dozen, anywhere maybe. between nine and fifty, uh, is what is what they were saying. But these would have been deaths of more highly society kinds of people. You know, not that not that the poor are any less important, but you know, because there was typhoid and different things in the poorer sections of New York, and you know, people died of typhoid, but not in the society ranks and not with the people that, uh, you know, had had the money and those kinds of things. And so it was an issue because of that. You know, and New York was working on updating the sanitation and, you know, doing all the things that they could do to cut down typhoid for the masses. Well, an issue, too, because, because it was the more high-profile people and someone said something about it and then they put the pieces together and realized it was one person that was, you know, a super spreader. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I have typhoid and I breathed on somebody. It was, I don't have typhoid and I'm just leaving this, you know, chaos in my wake. (laughs) Kind of an issue, too. Yeah, and I mean, typhoid's still a thing now. Mm -hmm. 27 million people worldwide get typhoid a year. It kills about 200,000 people. Uh, It's treatable. I mean, it's pretty easily treatable with antibiotics these days. Yeah, this was before penicillin. Right. And I could see how, you know, if this was in the slums, I don't think anybody would have connected the dots. But like you said, because it was such an unusual thing for these wealthy families to be coming down with an illness that you find where there's poor sanitation, probably made this much more high profile. Right. The other thing they said was at the time, typhoid had about a 10% uh, mortality rate, you know, and that, that's pretty high. And that's even, you know, once you got it, you, you know, one in 10, we, we think of COVID and the death rates that were associated with that. And, you know, I don't even know what the number was. It was like half of a percent or, or less, I'm sure if you got COVID, but with this typhoid at 10% and we saw some things and there was a gravestone that we saw of a young man that was 27. And you, I said to Raven, this family had money because, here's an elaborate gravestone where there was a, a big burial in his name and it, you know, said that he died of typhoid. And you could tell this isn't well, the kind of a gravestone that the poor would have. This had to have come from a, a family that a lot of wealth with. Right. And so even there, you know, I mean, once you got it, it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor because you just, you know, you had that 10% chance of, of passing from it. Well, and then, you know, going back in, into Mary's defense, and not even, I don't know, not even in her defense. Let's say that she was just as hygienic as she could be, but she was so, I mean, you know, her sweat would test positive. You know, let's say she just was, you know, in a sweaty in kitchen. In a hot kitchen. And, you know, brushes her hair out of her eyes, you know, and her forehead's sweaty. Boom. She's got, you know, typhoid on her fingers. So, you know, it's hard to say, but she she spread some, some havoc. So they put her, you know, they kept her until she died, and she died of a stroke? I think so. Yeah, Basically I mean, of old age in her well, she 70s, was, 69. She was in her well, late... Yeah, she had a stroke and then deteriorated after yeah. that. Yeah. But she, she died in her late 60s, and I think someone went into her, her room and just found her on the floor. So I think they said it was a stroke. Um, but, yeah, kind of, a, kind of a sad life for Miss Mallon. So... The paranormal part of this, I gotta pull it up. Because we don't just talk about super spreaders. This is not a medical. We have a medical expert, but Doc's it's not medical a, show. It's not a medical paranormal. You're giving me ideas, people. <laughs> Somewhere here I have. Okay. Mary Malland. It says that there are 
dozens of spots where her disease-ridden spirit, I thought that was kind of harsh. (laughs) Her disease-ridden spirit can be seen. There's hundreds of places that she's actually said to haunt. So I'm going to assume maybe everywhere that she spread her illness. Um, But the Raymond Cemetery is where her ashes were buried. It's got countless tales of a wandering specter matching her description that jump out and scare tourists. Yeah, but her description from all the photographs and everything she got, she was a very good-looking woman. She was pretty. They they show a picture. One of the one of the pictures that you see the most is her laying in a bed in the in the quarantine, and she just looks pissed. <laughs> <laughs> she's but <just laughs> but she's she's a you know she's a pretty woman. Mm-hmm, she is. The other one, the the picture that you'll see a lot is of her cooking, and there's like skulls coming down into the food that she's making. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, that was. On YouTube, we'll throw a, a picture of that up so you can look at and it. And the picture of her in the bed looking just pissed as hell. Oh, my gosh. So we'll get some pictures of her on the YouTube. So go go out to our YouTube channel, YouTube slash Advanced Paranormal. I could see her being a restless this. spirit of just, you lock me up. Ah. So there's a hospital called the Sloan Hospital for Women, probably where she worked before she got taken in again. Um, it says it's not only inundated with Mary's ghosts, but also the restless dead of those whose deaths she caused. It says Mary's ghost, along with countless other spirits, demons, and creatures of nightmarish proportions. I had to say that part of it word for word because that's cool. Nightmarish proportions. Called North Border Island um, their home. Um, you know, if you figure you've been quarantined there for a good chunk of your life... You're probably going to haunt there. Well, and then all of the other people that were quarantined there and died there. Mm -hmm. So North Border Island is located in New York's East River, uh, kind of between Bronx and Rikers Island. It actually has a lot of atrocities kind of baked into its history. for For a little while, it was where the Riverside Hospital was. It was a clinical unit that um, handled infectious diseases and isolated, you know, victims of of these diseases. Um, It was also the site of a shipwreck of a steamship that uh, is called the General Slocum, and it it had an issue there on June 15th, 1904, and more than a thousand people died on it, and their bodies were Oh, was that the one with, like, the the prisoners of war or something? I'm not sure. German prisoners, and, like, they had to jump from a burning ship? Possibly. It doesn't think, give yeah. It doesn't give I've that heard, many details. I've heard that, yeah, and it, that was right there. Yeah, but it said a thousand people, more than a thousand people died, and their bodies all washed ashore. So that island yeah. is haunted by not only Mary Mallon, but like gobs and gobs of other people. Yeah. Um, it says there's a telltale sign that you are in the presence of Mary's phantom. Um, it's powered. They say just biological havoc on your system. Folks say that they feel the presence of typhoid Mary's ghost. They feel an onset of fever-related symptoms, hallucinations, abdominal pain, weakness, headaches, vomiting, diarrhea, and red spots flowering like mad over their chest. Wow. In that it, she indeed has a disease-ridden soul. Yes. Wow. Okay. And they're sure they didn't just eat some bad medicine. <laughs> you know, there, there, there is that too. There is that. So I found that very interesting. So I've always heard of Typhoid Mary, and it's even—I mean, it's—it's it's so ingrained into history that even and our now, lore, our, yeah, the culture. Lore, you know, if anybody has illness following around, then what do you do? You call them a Typhoid Mary. Nope. And it was the papers back in the in the early 1900s that actually gave her that term, typhoid Mary. You know, if someone's sick all the time, you're such a typhoid Mary. I wonder is this is this Riverside Hospital on on uh, North Brother Island still standing? I don't know, but that would be a fascinating place to go and investigate. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, that island, whether the hospital is standing or not, would probably be very active. Absolutely. We will have to check into that. We could do just a podcast on just that. That might be one to look at. I thought that was a good episode. I learned a lot. But then I always do. 
All right. Well, stay spooky, my haunty friends. Hey, have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next time. Have a good one, everyone. You've been listening to The Supernatural Hour at AdvancedParanormal.com. The Supernatural Hour is part of the Radio Ronin Network, found at RadioRonin.com. Copyright by Advanced Paranormal Services.